There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's sea. And when I am tossed about, it sends out a light that I might. Good morning. I'm Mike McDonald, and we are in a Bible study of 1 Corinthians. Last week we left off uh, at the end of chapter 6, and we'll pick up chapter 7 this morning. Before we get started, however, if you are a believer that Jesus Christ is your Savior, right now you need to silently confess all known sin to God the Father. Uh, doing that will put the Holy Spirit in control of you, uh, and He will be at liberty to help you understand what we're fixing to go through. Uh, it's the Word of God, and, uh, and, and we will need help understanding it. If you're not a believer that Jesus Christ is your Savior, then the only thing relevant to you in Scripture is believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior. So let's go to the Father now and silently do that. Gracious Father, we come before you today thankful for your many provisions for us. Thankful for your word. Thankful for this place we can come together in peace and study your word. We ask, Father, that you help us understand it and apply it to our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh... So in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, speaks of a letter that Paul wrote to this Corinthian church before he wrote 1 Corinthians. We don't have a copy of that letter. Now Paul is going to speak of a letter that the Corinthians wrote to him. We don't have a copy of that letter either. But what we do have is Paul answering a lot of questions and he starts out several uh, verses, he starts out several phrases with now concerning. And it's now concerning what you wrote me about. And this now concerning phrase is going to extend all the way through chapter 7. Uh, and we can, we can break that down, y'all probably already have, but he's addressing some serious problems, uh, problems with division in the church. He addressed that in and it's starting with about verse 10 in chapter 1, going through chapter 4, and then disorders in the church. Uh, he did that in chapter 5 and 6. We've already finished that. Now uh, Paul begins to answer a direct questions that he has received from them, uh, and con the ones concerning marriage, he answers in chapter 7. In chapter 8, through the first verse in chapter 11, we have it concerning uh, <clears throat> uh, personal liberties that each individual has. And then chapter 11 through chapter 14, we have church order. Uh, and then in chapter 15, we have doctrine on the resurrection. So right now, we're going to start with uh, the marriage relationship in chapter 7. It, occur, it occupies uh, quite a bit of uh, the Word of God, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The teaching of our Lord and the direct ministry of the Holy Spirit after our Lord's ascension puts this matter uh, on a very high plane. Marriage for a believer becomes God's picture. Now get this. The marriage for a believer is God's picture he's, he's giving to us in Scripture of the mystic union uh, between Christ and the body of Christ, Christ and the church, okay? Christ and the church and, and the divine institution of marriage are supposed to coincide. Uh, our, our marriage uh, here on earth is supposed to picture that. In fact, in many, if not most, 
of the Christian marriage ceremonies, that's actually stated in the ceremony as Christ is head of the church. So in the early church, uh, there were great many irregularities in, in marriage and in the marriage ceremony. Uh, and uh, he's going to try to correct some of those. Many of those irregularities in marriage still happen in the United States and in other countries. Some commentaries think it's important. I got one commentary that I really like. Uh, thinks it's very important to determine whether or not Paul was married because, you know, Chapter 7 is going to be about marriage. And he thought it was very important that we determine whether or not Paul is married. And the reason he stated that is that if he was not married, then he doesn't have any experience in marriage. So everything he tells us is just theory. Well, personally, <laughs> personally, I don't care whether he's married or not. Uh, and I, I, I think that is totally unimportant. I mean... What have we learned about Scripture? Every single word in Scripture is God breathed. You don't; those apostles didn't have to know anything about the these subjects. It's, we we learned in Second Timothy chapter three verse sixteen that uh, that Scripture is actually God breathed. He breathes it out. We learned in First Corinthians chapter two verse thirteen that every single word of Scripture, each individual word of Scripture, is given to the writer by God the Holy Spirit. He uses the words in their vocabulary to, to uh, encourage them to put those words down in Scripture. So, whether or not Paul had ever been married is totally irrelevant. Uh, I was recently uh, in a, a class, and one of our members will remember it, uh, that reminded me of something that is extremely important. Uh, context is very important, but context involves more than just the subject matter that we're talking about in Scripture, the whole subject matter. Like frequently I've told you to understand this, you need to read the chapter before it and the chapter after it. Well, this, is, this even brings out another point. Um, scripture was written for us, okay? But there's not any Scripture in the Bible that was written to us. It was all written to somebody else. And it was written for them, to them. It's also written for us. But none of it is written to us. So what does that tell you? We need to try to understand the normal daily lifestyles of those this scripture is written to. To understand in deep regard as to what he's saying to us. Often it adds understanding to how we go about reading the scriptures. So with that in mind, let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Okay. Uh, this introduction applies now concerning these two words, peri day. Uh, applies to the entire rest of, this, of chapter 7. The first two words, peri day, now concerning, are repeated in verse 25. They're repeated in chapter 8, verse 1. They're repeated again in chapter 16, verse 1, and in verse 12. And Paul repeats them repeats in, in other uh, letters that he wrote. So this is a common uh, way to introduce a different topic or a different area of the topic you're referring to. So it's very common. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, um, this, is, uh, this just begs to be misunderstood. Okay? Uh, it, uh, many scholars believe that this is a quotation, actually, from part of the letter that the Corinthians wrote Paul. Okay, like we had before in Luke chapter six, uh, no, like like uh, chapter six verse twelve in in First Corinthians, 
and verse 13 and in verse 18 we had Paul repeating a slogan that he that was that he was trying to counteract and they think that this is uh, this may very well be a fourth slogan that was designed by Satan to attack the divine institution of marriage okay it would be argued that even those who were married should abstain from sexual relations okay so that in itself would cause uh, the, the marriage unit to seek sexual relations outside the marriage unit. So it would in itself be a deterrent to the divine institution of marriage. So that, okay, that he's, that's what he's attacking. So now the word woman, gunaikos, that, that means uh, woman. That means a married woman or an unmarried woman. There's no variation there. There's no distinction there. Married woman or unmarried woman. The word uh, andra means man, okay? And it means a married man or an unmarried man. There's no distinction there, okay? So that in itself uh, would tell you, and this word uh, hoptestai, uh, that means to touch, okay? Hoptestai means to fasten to, to touch, to cling to, and to have carnal intercourse with a woman. So the, this word can be woman, married or not. This word can be touch the wall, you know, or touch a woman. And this word can be husband or man, okay? So all of that indicates that you need the context of this whole chapter to understand what we're talking about. And we, can, we get from this the idea, the stupid idea that didn't get very far in the United States, but is very very common throughout the world is that all women should be subservient to all men because this word means woman this word means man and that's what scripture is saying okay but that's not what scripture is saying uh, so it, it it begs to be uh, uh, confusing so many have drawn from this that the apostle was an advocate of celibacy well uh, there's nothing wrong with that if you have that gift from God, but you better have it uh, or you're not going to make it very far. Uh, the Roman church is very fond of pointing to this verse as though it taught uh, that the unmarried monk or priest and the unmarried nun is a much holier person than a husband or a wife because they're unmarried. Scripture does not say that. The apostle is not saying that. Okay, consider. He does not speak of serving the Lord. He does speak of serving the Lord without distractions, particularly in a time of persecution. And this letter was written in a time of persecution. So that in itself would encourage a man, if he's going to uh, public confess Christ, not to drag his wife into that because you're just putting a target on both of you's back. So that in itself would deter marriage. He is saying Corinth was in the shadow of the temple of Aphrodite. Remember Aphrodite? Uh, that temple had a thousand so-called vestal virgins. Uh, sex was their religion. Okay? He does talk about, uh, well... Uh, history talks about the wife in the Roman world was property, was chattel, okay? She was a workhorse in the house. Some of that hadn't changed. Uh, a man, normal Roman man, generally had several wives, usually three. One had charge of the kitchen. One had charge of the living area. Another had charge of the clothes. You know, clothes had to be made and cleaned and taken care of. Sex was secondary to any of that because the man went to the temple. Well, you know, those 1,000 vestal virgins probably weren't the ugliest women around. You know, they were the youngest, prettiest women in the area, right? 
So that's where, the, that's where it was expected that the man would go to have uh, uh, sex taken care of. So this is what Paul is writing. This is who he's writing to. These are the people that were raised in that atmosphere. So uh, Dr. McGee writes that if you, uh, you will find this very same attitude of more than one wife for the work of the, of the family and sex outside the family, you will find that same attitude in the Bedouins of Palestine today. Uh, so it hadn't gone away. It's still here. Men are still ridiculous. Uh, and, and they're still confused. So here Paul is actually, what we're going to find out here, is he's actually lifting marriage out of slavery and putting the wife on an equal footing with the man. Paul gets a really bad rap uh, about from women. I, I know of women who, who uh, are believers uh, who like to not believe anything Paul wrote. Well, that's, that's most of the New Testament, you know. That's not, not a real good attitude to have. Uh, because of his attitude, they think his attitude toward women. Uh, and, and it's completely wrong. Okay, so, so we get through that. Uh, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Uh, that does not mean exactly what everybody thinks it means. And then he gives us reasons, okay? Verse 2, but because of immoralities, remember, same word we had before, that's not all immoralities, that word is really fornication, but because of immoralities, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Well, <laughs> okay, but because of immoralities. Uh, Paul's talking about fornication. He's, he's presenting this as a threat, okay? This desire is a threat, and as, since it is a threat, he's going to actually give orders. The, he's got an imperative in here. Let each man have his own wife, all right? These are all singular words. That in itself is an insult to the Roman man, okay? Let each man have his own wife. Uh, singular, that's ridiculous. Uh, but Paul's writing it anyway. Have is a present active imperative. This is a command, a uh, third person singular. Uh, and it is necessary that he make this command because of the society and the fornication that's common in the society. At this time, Jewish teachers, this is what the man's taught, this is what the Jewish person was taught. The, at this time, Jewish teachers and some Gentiles viewed marriage, the divine institution of marriage, which they didn't consider it a divine institution, they viewed marriage as, uh, and marital intercourse as the best deterrent to extramarital sexual relations. They believed that was, that was the main purpose of sex in the marriage totally getting away from the partnership. Uh, you can read Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 through 20, it gives you a pretty good, sometimes Proverbs gets kind of X-rated if you're uh, listening to it right. Uh, let's turn to Proverbs, just to let you know what Paul's talking about. Proverbs chapter 5, Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Drink water from your own cistern. Oh, stay at home. And running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad? Streams of water in the street? No. Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? So this is Old and New Testament stuff. Um, and 
even in the Proverbs, we're having information about stay at home. Okay, and continuing, and let each woman, this is really insulting, okay, and let each woman have her own husband. Does it sound, sound insulting to you? Okay. Uh, as if all of the singular words in the first clause were not shocking enough, okay, Paul now elevates woman from the place of slavery to her rightful position. Slavery is a normal condition for humanity. It still is a normal condition for humanity. No one has to teach a child how to misbehave. That's just one of the things you don't have to teach anybody. That happens automatically. Children of any society that teaches that they are inherently better or superior to somebody else will welcome that idea. They'll latch onto that right away. I mean, they might not, you, know, you might not be able to pick up the first time uh, that 12 times 12 is 144, but you'll pick it up the first time when you're told you're superior to that other guy. You'll learn that right away. Uh, people are basically our sinners. The basic instinct is to control, to have power, to dominate. That's, that's the way we are. We're sinners. Without Bible doctrine in a society, humanity descends. Generally, throughout history, women have been abused, abused by men, and that's still happening today. Paul is introducing Bible doctrine to these Corinthians, and it seems very radical to them. In the first clause, <clears throat> remember the first clause, uh, let each man have his own wife. <clears throat> In the first clause, each man translates the word hekastos. Uh, it's a pronominal adjective. Uh, it's nominative. I uh, mean, we're talking about the subject. It's masculine and it's singular. Okay? Each man. Uh, actually, it just says each. Uh, the word man is not there. Each is, is all that says. The words his own is not there either. That translates another pronoun, uh, heautu, <clears throat> and it's singular. So his own is not there, it's just his. Uh, the word own is not there, it means of himself. Wife translates gunaika, which is a form of, of uh, woman, uh, and it means woman married or not. In the second, so that's what the first clause says. Man's not in it, all right? He's just suggested. In the second clause, each woman has got exactly the same uh, pronominal adjective, only in the feminine ending. Uh, it is the same word as above. However, when you get to her own, she actually has a word that means belong to. Uh, uh, Edio, um, I-D-I-O-N, belonging to. And husband is andra, meaning... Uh, man or husband. So both clauses have exactly the same verb uh, and it's an imperative. Uh, each one each one owes owns the other one. All right? That's what that's what this is saying. Each one owns the other one. It is specific for the woman. She has she has the word your own in it. The man doesn't. He he just has a uh, a uh, adjective there. You, of himself, well, I mean a pronoun. <clears throat> so it's specific for the woman because that was contrary to the entire society. She wasn't supposed to own anything. And what Paul's saying is he owns you, you know. She owns you if you're married to her. Each uh, God created woman as a helpmeet for him uh, because he needed her. A helpmeet for the man. Uh, she corresponds to him. I mean, God created her that way. She corresponds to him, uh, and she's a partner to him. So Paul is here lifting m women and the marriage unit out of the degrade degradation that, of slavery that the woman was in. Every man is to have one wife, and every woman is to have her own husband. They are companions. It was in Ephesians 
when he wrote this letter, I wrote this in a letter. In Ephesians, there, there was much the same society that you had in, uh, um, um, that, that Paul is, 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 uh, is writing to in Corinth. Uh, in Ephesus, there was, uh, there was the temple Diana, much like uh, Aphrodite. It was the Ephesians that Paul wrote, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Um, uh, Ephesians 5.25 Since we're here, uh, I want to address a common Bible myth. Uh, it's something in the Bible people think is in the Bible, and it is uh, commonly believed by Christians, mainly men, uh, and it's not in the Bible. And that is, wives are to obey their husbands. That is not in the Bible, okay? Uh, and you, you, they usually get it from Ephesians, where Paul does write in Ephesians, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, but obey is not there. Uh, the word submit in English means to give over or yield to. It translates the Greek word hupos, hupotasso, uh, and it means uh, I subject myself. Uh, well, it means I subject. Uh, in the middle or passive voice, it means I subject myself. With that in mind, consider that this word is not even in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verse 22. Let's, let's turn to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Okay. So obey's not there. Uh, Paul writes, wives, submit. That word submit yield to, translates hupotasso, I subject or I subject myself. Uh, the verse reads, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. Anything left out there? Wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. The idea of submit there comes from the verses before it. All right. The idea of submit is taken from verse 21, which is talking about believers in general. That'd be us together, you and I together, believers in general, submit to one another in your daily lives. That's what, that's what this is talking about. You when you're cons talking to believers, when you're associating with other believers, you consider their feelings just as much, if not more, than your own. You consider their welfare just as much as your own, if not more, than your own welfare. That's what he's talking about. And he brings that over into the marriage situation and, and just borrows that word submit. So it, just like you would not expect that Scripture would tell you that another believer had to obey you, uh, it doesn't say that. It says submit to other believers in your association with them. So Ephesians does not say anything about wives obeying their husbands. Now let's turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter <clears throat> chapter 3. Verse 1 through 7. <clears throat> wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your ornament, and then he talks about how they're dressed. For in this manner, down in verse 5, for in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husband. And then we get to verse 6. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter you are, if you do good and are not afraid. Well, here the word obey really is there. But it's Sarah doing something. It's not Peter 
commanding that wives obey their husbands. Sarah did obey. Do you remember what Sarah obeyed Abraham about? She had to do this twice. He moved into another area, uh, and he was afraid that since she was so good looking, the king there was going to kill him and take his wife. Okay, so he had her tell everybody that she's his sister. Okay, so Abraham, on two different occasions, completely failed the Lord in lack of faith. The Lord told him to go there, completely failed in being faithful to the Lord and, and, and allowing him to protect them. He, he depended on Sarah to protect him. In both cases, the Lord was gracious enough to get them both out of that situation without anything bad happening. But it was Sarah obeying Abraham uh, even when she was being mistreated. And she definitely was being mistreated. Uh, she was being mistreated by her believing husband, but he was unfaithful to the Lord in doing that. So, that, so Peter is saying, if even when you are being mistreated, uh, you are in a position to do some good by being submissive to your husband. So, uh, now if I, if I haven't gotten the attention of the us husbands here, let's go to verse 7. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife, as the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, you are heirs with your wife of the grace from the Lord in the life that you're living. And then he says that your prayers may not be hindered. So what Peter is saying, treat your wife right, or the Lord's not going to listen to your prayers. It's just that simple. Uh, so... Uh, Obey is, uh, it doesn't seem to fit in there. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I think we have room for verse 3. Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife. This may take longer. And likewise also the wife to her husband. This, I read this, I, I, I have often read this verse, and I have wondered why on earth did the Lord feel it necessary to put this in Scripture? I mean, let the, hus uh, let the husband fulfill his day. He's talking about having sexual relations with your wife. Uh, and he's encouraging that. And why does that have to be there? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, so, none of, my, none of my many commentaries say anything about this. <laughs> they, just, they just read the verse and go on. Okay. However, my cultural backgrounds study Bible by Thomas Nelson does say something about it. Uh, and it'll give you an idea of how intrusive uh, the Jews were on their people. Okay. The Judean marriage contract. Okay. Marriage contracts offer stipulated duties. All right. Judean marriage contracts required husbands to grant their wives sexual intercourse. Strong advocates of marital intercourse, rabbis debated whether the maximum period a husband could deprive his wife was one week or two weeks apart from the exception of the husband being on a voyage or away studying the Torah. Okay? Paul does... Paul does not specify a period here, but he clearly advocates uh, marital relations. That's in my customs book. Uh, so this is, this is tying in to the Roman idea of marriage and that the wife was uh, a slave. Paul is still elevating the wife to equality with her husband. She is his partner in a union in which he is leader under Christ. She is not a servant. The wife, uh, Te Gunaika, uh, is first in this clause because she's emphasized. Next we have the husband's debt. All right? Paul is not talking about in 
and your translations will probably read this. He's not talking about a duty. He's not talking about due benevolence. He's talking about a debt. This is a debt. Let the husband fulfill means let him pay his debt. And that let him pay is an imperative. It's a command. This is a command from an apostle. This is viewed by God as a marriage, divine institution number two, and a debt owed by the husband to the wife. And likewise also the wife to her husband. So put the husband first because he's the one that thinks him, he's better than everybody else, especially in the marriage. Uh, I'm not saying that y'all think that way. I'm saying that's who, he, that's who Paul's writing to. Okay, He doesn't write any scripture to us, but he does write scripture for us. And likewise also the wife. So the word likewise translates homoios, and it means in a similar way or in the same way. So the words debt and command, uh, or let, let her pay, apply to the wife also. Again, Paul is using similar and same terminology to describe things of the wife and things of the husband. Uh, and next week we'll get into verse 4 where we find out that each is actually the property of the other. Do we have any questions? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I don't know where they came up with that. Uh, in the Jewish uh, society, when this was written, it was assumed, it was almost mandatory that a Jewish man be married by the time he was 18. Uh, and, and commentaries concerning that um, it's written that if a man is not married, he's not a man in the eyes of a Jew. So I don't know, I, it doesn't say anything about marriage, although this verse doesn't say anything about it. You can get that from the NIV. Uh, we have uh, people in our church or visiting our church uh, that, think, that help write the NIV and they think it's the best translation available. I personally don't like it at all, uh, but that's just me, and I don't know as much Greek as that guy does. But uh, uh, I would prefer uh, the New King James or the NASB first. But uh, no, what you have there uh, is uh, literally, now about things of which you wrote, it is good for a man, a woman, not to touch. Marriage is not in it. Anything else? It doesn't say touch. It just says sexual relations. Uh, well, that's what the verse is talking about, uh, but that's not there either. Anything else? Okay. Gracious Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for all of the people that have gone before us that you have blessed with understanding of your word and they've left us notes to study and learn your word. We ask, Father, that you help us discern from that and from your word what your message is to us. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.